In Tenakoto, I'm Selwyn Manning and welcome to A View From Afar. And today, in this, the first episode of A View From Afar for 2023, political scientist Paul Buchanan and, and I, we're going to um, be looking at, and I'll just bring it up on screen, we're going to be looking at uh, what um, uh, is AUKUS's purpose in 2023 and going forward and what are the risks to New Zealand's national and public interest? What does AUKUS's success look like? And what could its failure look like also? And beyond this, we're also going to headline the latest on the United States Pentagon leaks, what's really happening there, and also headline the global geopolitical theatre. And, and specifically, we'll just headline today uh, and look at it deeper in, pre, in, in subsequent episodes. Um, how stable is the Russian Federation's President Vladimir Putin's regime? So without uh, holding off any longer, I just wanted to also say that uh, those that are, of you that are joining us live, um, do feel free to make comments uh, via YouTube if you're there. That's the preference, but also Facebook uh, should be working okay as well. But just remember, if you do make comments or um, put lodge questions that interaction could be used in this program. So uh, Paul is waiting online and let's cross to him and we'll deep dive into our primary issue and that is what is AUKUS's purpose and is it a risk to New Zealand's national and public interest should New Zealand, along with other um, Asia Pacific um, nations, join AUKUS through the Pillar 2 and Paul will take us through that. Um, kia ora Paul, um, tēnā koe e hoa. Uh, how are you Paul? Uh, I know you got hit over on your side of the North Island uh, pretty badly. Uh, we're still uh, in recovery mode. I mean, you may see, well, I was going to say, if you look over one of my shoulders, there's a bunch of candles on the uh, the fireplace mantle piece, and it's because we've had constant power outages. Um, you know all of this, but maybe some of our, our listeners don't. But my little settlement of 300 people on the west coast of Auckland uh, is in a valley, and I'm up at the top, so we didn't suffer a lot of damage, but the bottom is total devastation. Uh, people have lost their homes. The hills came down, slid down, and so there's about 20 homes that are no more. People lost everything. Uh, the roads were washed out for weeks. Um, they were helicoptering stuff in and out uh, for at least a month. In fact, I think it was six weeks before the chopper stopped. 
Uh, my 10 year old became an expert on helicopters, uh, thanks to those, uh, you know, those very needed relief uh, flights. And we're still, you know, it's it, thanks to some local builders, they've managed to clear the road, but the, um, the clearing and it, they've done a magnificent job, but it was done without bureaucratic resource consents. Uh, and so all of the works are, are deemed illegal and the road is deemed closed, which means people who drive on the road, uh, their insurance will not cover any damage. And the road's been turned into dirt. I mean, basically it's a dirt, a well-maintained dirt road, a uh, single track, uh, so yeah, it's uh, this place isn't going to be the same. And to be honest with you, Selwyn, uh, you know, my wife and I, for the first time in the twenty some odd years I've lived out here, are thinking of moving. Wow. Um, yeah, it's because the 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 local council, you know, Auckland Transport are the guys who do the roads. They have basically thrown their hands up, and they're saying that at best. The end of 2024 will be when the roadworks, uh, they're not even saying completed, that the roadworks will be, and at that point, there's a question mark, halfway through, just starting, that sort of thing. And uh, it's it's so disruptive. I mean, even trying to drive the kid to practice, uh, soccer practice uh, on weeknights, uh, we can't do it because it's it's too dangerous. I mean, that's there's huge trenches. Uh, the fall off on the downhill side, uh, we're talking drops of 100 meters, sheer wow. drops. So, um, yeah, it's been a tough three or four months. Uh, everybody talks about resilience, but I'd actually say this, and I'll leave it with this instead of whining anymore. Um, you've heard of the three uh, stages of grief, right? Denial. Uh, sadness and then acceptance. Well, we got like a fourth one, which is frustration yeah. because we're not getting any satisfaction for our taxpayer dollars. I mean, again, Auckland Transport, public agency just threw their hands up and go, ooh, that's too big. I've got four major uh, uh, slides or slips on my road, four of them. And uh, they, they looked at the first one uh, which is the 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 uh, how could I say it easiest of them or the smallest of them, and they're like no way, it's you know no. so uh, uh, we're making the most of it. And the good news is you know the kid goes to school 300 meters from our fence line, so he'll be able to do school. Uh, you know it's become a major hassle for people with high school kids who are trying to get into town because the nearest high school is 20 kilometers away, but. Uh, all in all, Selwyn, um, compared to some of the neighbors further down the hill from us, uh, we are very, very fortunate. And I try to focus on that rather than all the uh, litany of, of woes that I've just outlined. Yeah. Um, and then in the region where I'm coming to you all from, um, you know, it's suffered its, uh, its the consequences of Cyclone Gabriel as well, like Paul has uh, alluded to there. And um, just like to acknowledge those that lost their lives um, in, in uh, what was a catastrophic event here. And for those all around the, uh, the Hawke's Bay region that, and Gisborne, um, uh, East Coast, uh, all up there, that where livelihoods, road infrastructure and everything has been wiped out. It looks like some post-apocalyptic uh, landscape in some places. And the power of the flash floods was such that railway line bridges, well, a railway line bridge, in, uh, well, numerous of them have been totally wiped out. And the force of the water has actually got some of the, uh, the bridges and their rails at right angles um, to where they once were, at 90 degrees to where they la were laid and, and running. And that's a, kind of a sad thing in a way too because the rail was only just up and running really after considerable political and local uh, input to get that. Uh, kind of happening. But those that lost their lives, it's an absolute sad event. Those that have lost their livelihoods and their life's work in many cases. And I think also to those in Eskdale, uh, which is uh, at the end of the Napier Talbo Highway, a state highway, where the whole area is just wiped out, really. Um, and that, right. that's something that you can only appreciate the devastation by seeing it with your own eyes. It's, it's absolutely catastrophic to see them in video form or in photographic form. And uh, to see it in person is uh, 
pretty out there. But it was some cyclone. And I know that those on the uh, the eastern side of the United States in particular know exactly what they're like. And uh, you've got some pretty mm. big, powerful ones there that the world watches at different times, as as there are all around the world. So with that done, Paul, we just acknowledged it properly and appropriately and a good explanation. And thank you for that, for why we have been delayed. It's not just Paul, it's myself as well. And um, thank you to the audience who have been writing in and asking um, whether or not our intention is to come back. Our intention is to come back every two weeks um, on, on that uh, type of uh, rhythm. Um, so please put it into your, uh, your diaries um, with an expectation that we will be and we will propagate um, information to, to confirm that on the social media platforms in particular. Um, but we might also set up a, um, a bit of a... Uh, an email um, uh, list uh, so that people who wish to can join that and we'll trigger them off so that they are well aware and confirmed when we are um, broadcasting. So, Paul, AUKUS. Now, this has been big in the uh, the news all over the world, really, obviously. Even at NATO, as I understand it, Paul, um, there was discussions from the United States, uh, input there that was saying, well, AUKUS is all a part of the security network and uh, even though conflict could or may happen down in the Indo-Pacific region, that uh, NATO has its responsibilities to its members wherever conflict may strike. And uh, those were interesting kind of things. Um, uh, there's also the Quad, which is a United States-led um, effort as well that operates in the more northern part of the Indo-Pacific uh, region. Um, there's the AUKUS, which is obviously Australia, um, the United Kingdom and the United States in a security alliance, I would call it there, Paul, you might correct me in some of my definitions, but please do so if I'm wandering off a little bit of the exactness there. Um, and uh, there is a thing called Pillar 2, which uh, allows countries like New Zealand that are perhaps more relatively independent or culturally like to think we are um, in New Zealand, um, where Pillar 2 um, provides the opportunity for engagement and indeed uh, some form of membership to AUKUS. And that seems like there is the uh, the extension and invitation and by way of the United States' visit from um, uh, some highly placed uh, officials from, from uh, Washington to New Zealand who, who uh, made that gesture. And our Labour-led government seems to be mulling that over. So, Paul, that's... Uh, the second introduction into the issue. Um, over to you. Can you take us through what is AUKUS? Um, what does um, success look like? Uh, what's AUKUS's purpose? And um, we'll look at what the risks are to New Zealand's national and public interest as well, if should it do take that opportunity to attach to Pillar 2. Okay, well, for uh, for some of the listeners who may, may not be up with the play, uh, so AUKUS, Australia... Uh, the UK and the United States uh, represents an agreement by the three countries to build nuclear powered submarines and station them at uh, HMAS Sterling Naval Base outside of Perth. And in preparation for that, uh, the US is going to begin forward porting Virginia class attack submarines uh, normally stationed in Guam, we'll be sending one of them on a rotating basis to HMAS Sterling, in part to allow the naval personnel on that base to familiarize themselves with the Virginia design, because that's going to be the basis of the Australian boats that are going to come in the 2030s. And so starting in, in 2027, we're going to see these Virginia class boats uh, permanently stationed on a rotating basis. Uh, outside of Perth. And that, of course, expands their ability uh, to patrol in the Indian Ocean. Uh, they can do a lot of things. They can, of course, come back relatively quickly into the South Pacific, uh, but they're there. And there's some significance to that. The idea is that um, you know, starting in 20, I think it's 34, the first of the Australian boats will be delivered, and it's based on the Virginia design. Then in, in the 2040s, an entirely new type of boat, which will be a combination of the Virginia class and then the British astute class attack boats, uh, and an entirely new model based on a combination of technologies uh, called the AUKUS class, 
will be delivered to the Australians, and I think they're going to get uh, four of them. Now, what's interesting about, and this is pillar one, okay? It's the submarine. It won't have nuclear weapons, but it will have nuclear propulsion. And, uh, and as we move towards New Zealand, you know, already people who know that New Zealand's a non-nuclear country uh, can yeah, imagine just, some of the reactions. Yeah. I was just going to yeah, ask, so, um, it, it wouldn't have nuclear weapons, but is it capable? Oh, they're certainly capable. Uh, but, you know, again, the, given the accuracies of the cruise missiles, so what they fire, I mean, they have torpedoes, of course, but they fire uh, cruise missiles you know, Tomahawk missiles. And, uh, you know, the, the, the accuracy of these missiles is such that, you know, it'd be a bit of an overkill to put nukes on them, plus all the diplomatic, you know, just all, all the baggage that it goes with, you know, having them nuclear arm. Uh, but I will say this, I mean, I might as well get this out of the way. We live here in the South Pacific in a nuclear free zone. The Treaty of Rarotonga of 1986, then ratified in the South Pacific Nuclear Free Zone Treaty of 1994 or five, I believe, or 1996, uh, specifies not only that there should be no nuclear weapons, testing, any of the sort, but there should be no storage of nuclear materials in the South Pacific. And when the treaty was drawn up, they actually drew a map of the area covered. Well, guess what? The entirety of Australia is covered by that treaty, and including the western fringe that faces the Indian Ocean. That is still considered to be uh, within the nuclear free zone. That's part of the reason why initially Australia went with French diesel electric submarines. People will remember that there was a big brouhaha because the French had already gotten into the design of these subs, and then the Australians pulled the, pulled the plug on the, on the project and uh, went with this, this AUKUS deal. Well, the reason the French both... The Anglophiles have pushed the French out of space, haven't they, with the AUKUS? In this but but, but initially, initially, the Australians wanted to adhere to the nuclear-free status, and the French are considered to be the best at building uh, diesel-electric boats. So it made sense for them to go with the French so long as they adhered to the nuclear free zone treaty. Something happened in Australia. Consecutive governments began to rethink this thing while allowing the French to continue. And then eventually uh, they pulled the plug last year and announced this new deal. Well, you know, we'll leave aside the French reaction and all that sort of thing. They've gone with the nuclear option. You have to understand the nuclear reactor in a submarine will need onshore servicing. And while the American boats rotate in and out, that servicing will be done in Guam. But once the first Australian boat arrives in the 2030s, there will have to be an engineering facility and laboratory that can service those reactors. That violates the treaty. And uh, it's going to get interesting because from my standpoint, uh, one of the major problems with AUKUS is that it sets a precedent to violate the nuclear free zone in the South Pacific. That means that other nuclear powers could forward port nuclear submarines if they so wish. If they're friendly, they could be the French or the British. But there are some unfriendly countries with nuclear submarines who have security deals in the Pacific. Let's think, for example, the Solomons, uh, the Solomon Islands and the People's Republic of China have a bilateral security deal that allows the Chinese to use ports in the Solomons. What's to stop them from forward porting a nuclear propelled submarine somewhere down the road? So that, that precedent to me uh, needs to be considered. You know, we need to discuss uh, if this was such a good idea after all. Now, more germane to our discussion, it's been floated in some security circles that New Zealand, in spite of its non-nuclear status, might be invited to what is called Pillar 2. And Pillar 2 are all the onshore advanced technological industries that go 
with uh, the building and maintenance of nuclear submarines, in particular, quantum computing, artificial intelligence, robotics, unmanned vehicles, uh, you know, all the sort of things, if you think of the high technologies that go into submarines, well, the idea is this is going to spawn a number of industries that have extremely high value added. The Australians are already lining up. The, the boats will be ported in Western Australia, Perth being the capital. But already, South Australia has a boat building industry. They want a piece of the action. Victoria, where well, Melbourne is located, they have a high tech sector. They want a piece of the action. Sydney wants a piece of the action. <clears throat> Excuse me. And guess what? Now, uh, certain elements in New Zealand say, well, perhaps we could get some of that action too. And this will help us economically. Well, that may be true, okay? I think that uh, certainly the defense forces here would like to have some of that high tech, uh, you know, money coming to New Zealand, especially if it has military applications that are non-nuclear. Uh, business elites, of course, welcome bringing in, uh, you know, high tech industries to a country that is still very dependent on the exportation of primary goods. You know, we, you know, we need value added industries in this country. And so certain elites are lining up to try to get a piece of the pie. And what I would say is this, you know, pillar two will not violate New Zealand's non-nuclear status. In addition, New Zealand will receive the benefits of having these, these submarines patrolling off its east coast, something that the Australians cannot do now because their Collins class diesel electric boats can't stay on station for any length of time when they're on the east coast of New Zealand. If the Australian boats come over to our east coast and the Americans can be relieved of the duty to, they're, they're shadowing Chinese boats as we speak. The Chinese regularly patrol off the east coast of New Zealand for a variety of reasons. And that would allow the Australians to chase them and allow the Americans to move further north. Um, our brand new anti-submarine warfare aircraft, the P-8s, uh, which have just started to be delivered, they are designed to be interoperable with Virginia class boats. So they'll be talking to these boats no matter what. I mean, you know, we're on their side. And so as they patrol, uh, our, uh, our P-8s uh, will be in contact with them. So, you know, we're, we're, you know, we will be dealing with these subs uh, outside of our territorial waters as a matter of course. The deal is this, Selwyn, um, and, and I hope you'll be able to address some of the diplomatic and, and objections. But uh, for me, the bottom line is this. Why on earth would the Australians give New Zealand any piece of the action when it comes to uh, this agreement. New Zealand not only is non-nuclear and makes a big deal about it, but uh, New Zealand is considered to be a free rider or a free loader, if you want to use a pejorative, when it comes to the Australian defense establishment. You know, we don't, you know, we, we spend less than 2% of GDP. I think that that number is completely arbitrary. But the idea is the New Zealanders do very little uh, for the protection that they're offered by the Australians, the United States, and bigger partners. And let's face it, Australian economic elites are not going to be happy to see some of this action being transferred to the New Zealand economy. Uh, you know, I, I simply said that for nationalistic reasons. Uh, because the idea is that will uh, take away jobs from Australians and give them the Kiwis. So I think that even though the Minister of Defense in New Zealand, Andrew Little, has he's, what he said is he'll consider pillar two, but the devil is in the details. So we don't still don't know the details. Uh, and they've got to sort out who in Australia is going to get a piece of the pie. Again, all the states now are vying. The only one who's assured of anything is Western Australia. Now, uh, when Andrew Little said that he would consider Pillar 2, there was immediate pushback from the Minister of Foreign Affairs. 
Nanania Mahuda. And she said, no way. She in fact said, what needs to be understood is that uh, elements of policy like this are made by cabinet, not by career bureaucrats. So direct slap in the face of the Ministry of Defense and the Ministry of, For uh, excuse me, Ministry of Business and Industry uh, who were pushing this, all right? I mean, she just slapped back at them and said, no way. And she, she has her reasons, of course, but what it tells us is there's now a fracture in the Labor Party between the right wing of the Labor Party, which Andrew Little represents, uh, which is you know more conservative security-wise, and then the left wing, and dare I say it, the indigenous wing of the Labor Party, yeah. which believes in the nuclear free treaty, is not interested in currying favor with the Australians, much less the United States. And so, and, and it's an election year on top of it. And so I think to myself, this thing is dead in the water. And the reason for that is the Australians aren't going to give up any of the action. And more importantly, in an election year, labor needs to cement its bases and throwing this in, the idea that we're going to be part of AUKUS, even if it's the non-nuclear part, could kill off support amongst the Greens and the left wing of the Labor Party itself. And this election looks to be fairly tight. So I think for political as well as economic reasons, uh, it's dead in the water, even though I personally think we should look at the details of Pillar 2, if it's ever offered to us, and then consider whether or not it's worth doing. And one last point. One of the objections, and I'm sure you can pick this up better than I do, the reduces to this. Uh, our pacifist friends, our, uh, especially our anti-American friends as well, will say, oh, but if you do that, the Chinese will retaliate. Because it's very clear that what this is, Selwyn, is more ring fencing of the Chinese. This is, in fact, designed to deter them from bringing military naval assets deep into the South Pacific, because they know that those boats will be on them. And I mentioned the Solomons and the forward porting. Well, uh, you can be assured that if they do that, then they will be one of these AUKUS subs hanging around the Solomons, uh, waiting to do them in in the event of conflict. So we've got a community here in New Zealand that are like, you know, don't don't annoy the Chinese. Uh, you know, they're very quick to, to see offense. And this is offensive to them because it's clearly directed at them. Absolutely true. What I would say to that is, the Chinese know which side New Zealand's bread is buttered when it comes to security. The Chinese have much bigger fish to fry in the Northern Hemisphere because there's a remilitarization led by the United States of the Northwestern Pacific. They got dangers and threats much closer to home. So us getting involved in Pillar 2 really is small potatoes. And yes, they may do something. They could retaliate and trade or whatnot, but I don't really think so. I think they got too much on their plate. So that, although I understand the concerns that we shouldn't annoy the Chinese any more than we have, uh, I think that they know how the game's being played. Uh, and I don't think this necessarily will be the straw that breaks the camel's back, so to speak, uh, when it comes to New Zealand's relationship with the PRC. Yeah. Um... I'll, I'll, I'll go through a number of points um, that underscore concerns relating to AUKUS, and, and, and in large part, they don't even involve China in the evaluation or the assessment of those uh, those weaknesses within AUKUS uh, or those agencies that are feeding into it. But just to just to um, to underscore that fact that you're talking about there, um, the moves of containment are clearly in evidence. You know, when you look at um, some of those security uh, arrangements that have been in play for the last 18 months, um, uh, it, it, it asserts that that's a clarity. And those are the quad, um, for example, you know, AUKUS itself, all, all of these arrangements, but also, you know, the United States hosting of the, uh, the president of South Korea um, and then clearly uh, um, uh, uh, engineered some sort of rapprochement 
or steps toward it between South Korea and Japan. It's like the United States is thinking to itself, we don't want any weak links in the security ring where we can contain China and we want um, a common ground on security right across. With respect to the Australians, you know, you've made some very strong points there, particularly how they relate or regard New Zealand in a defence security capacity. And I think, um, you know, in, in recent months, we've seen Australia and New Zealand strengthen their defence ties in this way. And it may be the insurance package that Australia has reached out to New Zealand on saying we acknowledge your concerns and sensitivities around AUKUS on various um, elements. That's why you were not invited in in the first place. We acknowledge the history where ANZUS Security Alliance all of those years ago in the late 80s where Australia and the United States pulled New Zealand out of it and kicked it to touch. Um, so, you know, for, for reasons relating to our um, anti-nuclear legislations and cultural positions on it as well. So all of that is the backstory to it. But let's, um, and for my part here, Paul, I'll uh, just look at a number of concerns that have come through from learned sectors um, back in Washington, D.C. Um, for example, um, and I'll just refer to my notes here to make sure I've got it all nice and clear. Um, the CSIS, which is the Center for Strategic and International Studies, based largely in Washington, D.C., but intersects very strongly, for example, with the, um, uh, the university in Sydney, Australia, particularly the United States Studies Centre. And people from that centre were in evidence at this panel discussion on May 5th, only uh, a matter of a week, a little over a week ago. One of the uh, key issues that was raised there, particularly from the Australians, um, but also uh, with respect to the Australian and United States strategic standpoint, was that this is a move away for Australia from a dependency of the United States in a pure security defence uh, relationship and one more of Australia being able to be supported as opposed to uh, reliant on the United States' as, um, military interventions should Australia find itself... Um, under attack or moving preemptively to attack in a defensive kind of preemptive um, means there. So that's quite a significant change and it may indicate why AUKUS and the submarine deal came into play there, whereas Australia moving into being a strong and significant and recognised regional power supported by the United States but not dependent necessarily on the United States to make decisions in Washington, D.C. relating to Australia's own national and security interests. So those those kind of changes seem to be very much in evidence and discussed between these various um, people at uh, the, the uh, event that was hosted by the CSIS. Now, but the concerns relating to AUKUS, AUKUS were very clear and it seemed a consensus was shared around that table. And one of the most significant ones there was the difficulty that AUKUS has uh, predicted um, for escalation control should conflict, mainly with China, obviously, um, occur. And that escalation control was in particular regard to nuclear conflict. And there was a, a noted uh, weakness within AUKUS and the security arrangements that are in evidence in the Indo-Pacific region on escalation control, just to once again underscore, um, particularly with respect to nuclear conflict. The other was equally as concerning from the point of view of planning and assessing the realities of threat. And uh, at the uh, CSIS meeting at um, Washington, D.C., it was identified that the Five Eyes Network is not so strong at identifying risk assessment ahead of an event. Um, it also was noted that how the security environment is being shaped that the intelligence apparatus feeding into security blocks like AUKUS was weak in that respect as well. Now that raises obviously concerns um, that when uh, the diplomatic uh, side is heated up, when the response from China, the competitive um, uh, relationship now that has been elevated and, and, and ex ex extended between the United States' interest and China, when things get hot as we've seen over Taiwan, um, that the abilities of the Western alliances and particularly the Anglophile alliances like AUKUS to assess accurately um, what is going on in such events um, is a, a weak point and that to me um, underscores a danger there of engagement for ind more independently positioned countries like New Zealand. Then there is um, my third point, Paul, and it's one that is a political reality in the sense that here um, I just noted 
that uh, in March, for example, CPAC, you know, the conservative body you know very well, and those around the United States listeners will know very well, is all around, in particular at this stage in the political cycle, testing out straw poll, for example, on where the Republican, um, where the Republican, the feeling of the base or the bases within the Republican Party are pointing toward their preferred uh, nominee for, to go for the presidency in 2024, or at least to indicate um, preferences of what kind of policies and positions such a nominee would take. And I'll just note some of the uh, results of the straw, straw poll that was held in Maryland at the CPAC in, in March. And the straw poll showed 95% of those polled approved of the job that Donald Trump did as US president. That's 95% approved. 78% of those um, that were left also, uh, also strongly approved of his um, performance as the President of the United States. 62% of all those polled at CPAC, 62%, want Donald Trump as the Republican candidate for the United States presidential campaign in 2024. DeSantis, who often is talked about as one of the more stronger candidates that can go head-to-head -head with Trump in the primaries, he only received 20% support from those polled as the preferred candidate for the Republican Party. And just remember, too, that DeSantis is not nowhere near the type of conservative or the Pat Buchanan type um, conservative or even the George Bush family um, conservative uh, wing and certainly not of the Liz Cheney types. So DeSantis is quite a different thing and perhaps um, you can speak with authority on those points. But, Paul, the instability in the United States politically I think is in evidence here. We see that while CPAC may have been stormed by mega type of uh, people that were voicing what their preferences were, um, CPAC is still a significant testing ground for where the Republican Party is. Um, we know that um, the Democrats are most likely going to run Biden through as the uh, candidate, or if there is another outlier at the moment, we, we haven't really got our heads around who that may be and how strong that candidate may be. Um, we get back to the point that, um, in reality, Joe Biden's age is a factor, and it's been discussed, and there are sureties that are coming out that he's still got the legs to do it. Um, the The fact of the matter is, though, that at some point where the Republican Party is currently pointing, there is a risk and a risk assessment that it may have involvement and input into becoming a significant force back again in the United States and certainly interfere in where policy settings are. Um, should it have a, a shot at the White House at this 2024 election or the subsequent one after, I would suggest that any modelling by countries that are considering positioning to attach to AUKUS need to not just look at the political environment around the United States right now, which is led by fairly stable hands within the Democratic Party, but model out the risk assessments that may be coming its way while significant pillars of political intent relating to MAGA-type policies and people are still strongly in evidence in the United States. So, Paul, those are my concerns, um, and you can see that I haven't even touched on um, the areas that you have, and that's relating to the cultural sensitivities, the political sensitivities of nuclear freedom in New Zealand um, and certainly in the Pacific with the anti-nuclear cultures that exist. And I'd suggest that the Indigenous wings, not just in the Labour Party, but right across the political spectrum in New Zealand, have a sensitivity and a reticence to engage on nuclear issues um, which may advance um, outside external power interests and influences. Um, and they share more, those groups in polit politics, with their Pacific counterparts who have suffered in the generations past and continue to do, and I'm talking about Marshall Islands, Christmas Island, of course, and French Polynesian uh, Islands, where the consequence of nuclear um, testing and nuclear industry has certainly affected the livelihoods and the health status of their peoples going into the uh, the next decades as well. So, Paul, that's my pitch. I would say to Andrew Little very strongly, and those policies policy analysts that are feeding into his his thinking, stay away. It is if it ever is a time to be reticent to engage or to attach in pillar two. There is, um, you know, obviously the arguments for that will be coming, and I note um, significant academics that have as well, Paul, but I would say for the reasons outlined here, my debate would be that you keep well away right at this time, for sure. 
Yeah, you make <clears throat> several very good points. Let me start with uh, this fact. Oh, and just as an aside, the first class of uh, Australian submarine officers uh, are in the United States training at the U.S. Navy uh, uh, nuclear engineering facility. I'm not sure if it's in Georgia, uh, someplace in the south, but never that, in any event, uh, the Australians are already training in the States uh, on these technologies. Now, um, you know, you and I know this, but let's just repeat this. Australia is not New Zealand, okay? Mm. Uh, they're very different cultures. Sure, we, you know, we play rugby, uh, speak, you know, variations of English, uh, but they're very different cultures, political cultures in particular. And so, the emphasis in Australia, I mean, I, I've always said Australia is the U.S. deputy sheriff in the southern hemisphere. Another way to look at it is the Australians and the U.S. are like bed partners. And New Zealand is the pillowcase, gets to look in at the action, but is not part of it. OK, and we like that position, I would say politically, our, you know, as a political nation, New Zealanders would prefer not to be that closely associated with the United States. So whether or not Australia will become uh, more self-reliant when it comes to defense, and I got my doubts about that. I think this may be about more closely integrating Australia into US war gaming. But whatever it is, we politically, don't want it, as far as I can tell, as far as I can see from local polls, even except for the most hardcore conservatives, um, even the right wing or the right center of our polity is not really interested in following the path of the Australians. So you're absolutely right. Uh, Andrew Little is on a hiding to nothing if he pushes this. However, there are economic elites in New Zealand and that that and that's why I mentioned it wasn't just the Ministry of Defense; it was the Ministry of Business Innovation and whatever it is, entrepreneurship, uh, who think this might be a good idea. I think politically, it's it's a no go, and certainly this year it'll be a no go. Now, you know, having said all of that, I think that what we have to understand is that uh, as much as New Zealand uh, may or may not have an interest in that, in, in joining AUKUS. The hard fact of the matter is, is that, and you alluded to this, most of the island states of the Pacific don't want nuclear propulsion, much less nuclear weapons in the South Pacific for the reasons you well enunciated. They have been the victims of nuclear weapons through the testing by the French, the United States, even further back, the UK. And these were atmospheric as well as underwater tests in uh, a number of places. And that legacy is, you know, is still felt very heavily throughout the South Pacific. Now, it's clear the Australians ignored the concerns of their Pacific neighbors when it came to signing this agreement. And so I would imagine if that I'm Fijian or Samoan or Tongan, I go, you know, I would be thinking as a, a leader of these countries, what else is in store with these darn Australians who violated the nuclear free treaty? And then there is, I think your most important point, absolutely important and probably uh, something that is a bit of a revelation to uh, particularly our American listeners. The point that the United States is viewed as being too unstable, too unreliable uh, to enter into these sort of agreements with is remarkable, but I would agree with you, it is true. The MAGA ph phenomena does not instill confidence amongst allies and in fact emboldens adversaries because some of these MAGA types are pro-Russian. They're on Russia's side in the Ukrainian-Russian conflict. A lot of them are sort of neo-isolationist. You know, this America first, oftentimes with some MAGA types, means American only. Uh, they want to retreat into a shell. Well, I think it's it's a brilliant point to make to uh, to Americans. 
the United States political establishment is increasingly viewed as unstable, as unpredictable, as oftentimes irrational, none of those things are good for maintaining leadership in on the global stage. None of them at all. And so, uh, you know, I thank you for bringing that up because I think it's a revelation. I think our American friends need to understand that Trump ruined everything. They allowed him to be president. And he has done so much damage to the U.S. reputation. Biden is sort of a caretaker guy, and you're right. He's a steady pair of hands, but with limitations, as we well know. But uh, should uh, Trump come back, much less win again, I happen to think he will not, but just his presence uh, instills fear and uh, anxiety in uh and in, in throughout the alliance structure because we can't be sure what the u.s will do in republican hands i mean i was thinking as as we were going to go on the air i thought you know the republican party has really devolved in the last decades or so you know it started way back when with newt ginrich uh but it's really devolved and then i thought no it actually it's degenerated it now has a significant amount of moral and eth ethical degenerates who are very influential, particularly in Congress. And these people are, you know, the people who, who can make policy. And if their guy gets elected, then, you know, who knows what's going to go on. Um, I say that, you know, I, I'm sorry if, if some people may not like the, uh, the Republican bashing, but maybe Republicans need to look in the mirror and realize that the U.S. has lost so much credibility as an ally that legitimate questions must be raised as to whether it will fulfill its end of the bargain in agreements such as AUKUS or any other and, agreement for that and, matter. And, and the Taiwanese I'd, I'd, are going to be the first to find that out. Exactly. I, I would um, suggest, you know, without um, being uh, over... <laughs> Over positioned on such things. But an observation from outside of the United States on this is the Republican Party, all people generally, obviously in diplomatic circles, but also right across the populations, all they want is reasonable people, reasonably thinking people, um, ascending into positions of power and influence. And uh, we can hardly take confidence in the track that the Republican Party seems to be at this stage cemented on and, 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 and embedded on and continuing on and sustaining on. Um, that that uh, lack of confidence in the immediate future of the United States is underscored by that part. We haven't even seen where the Democratic Party is intending on taking foreign policy or trade policies in hand in hand in the next four to five years as a caretaker type of uh, presidency or administration like you've alluded to there, there is a sense of, well, we're getting some, able to breathe easier at the moment. But it does not suggest that there are succession plans in place where uh, long-term agreements, are all, albeit alliances in a defence security space, um, should be entered into. And I'd say the Australians are... You know, they've had their long-term histories, culture engagements, and also obviously um, security defence engagements with the United States that have endured presidencies going back decades. And New Zealand hasn't. And uh, New Zealand has carved out a place in the, in the world that can sustain its efforts while sharing uh, on, on issues of multipolarity, for, for example, um, and picking up issues that sit well with its own perceived culture. Um, so those are areas where New Zealand's positioned one politically, irrespective of what party is in power, and certainly from the point of view of policy and consideration of response to global events that it may or may not support intervention on. So, um, you know, I'm just um, adding those things as a New Zealander, obviously by my accent and by birth, um, that Paul's assessment in these areas of New Zealand's uh, position and culture. Um, I'd also add, though, that New Zealand is not um, 
totally idiosyncratic in this way that excludes all others, that this particular type of observation um, is, is one where it can be generally believed to be shared by others in the ASEAN group, other states and economies in the ASEAN groups, and certainly among the Asia-Pacific fraternity. Um, and uh, th this uh, issue of AUKUS, Paul, is a concern. Now, there's been some, a uh, couple of comments, and uh, questions and comments that has come in from Matthew Grace. And Matthew, I appreciate your input here. I'll just put these out here so that the audience can consider them uh, that are listening to it and also for Paul to respond should he wish to. Um, and Matthew puts here, what are the benefits of Pillar 2? Canada appears to be very interested in joining. If we do not join, does that mean, meaning New Zealand, does that mean we will no longer be able to interact with our traditional partners? Um, and secondly, Matthew makes the uh, um, uh, uh, puts the piece here, I, I think that the strength of anti-nuclear position is weaker now than it was 20 years ago. Nuclear is likely to be a core technology to support countries to decarbonise their economies. I'll just, um, just add to that before you respond to those two um, communications, Paul, that Tonga, as an island nation, had considered in the 2000s to um, have the new generating a new new nuclear generators for energy. You know, they're almost like the size of a refrigerator. Um, I've got to say that uh, countries like Australia and New Zealand talk them out of engaging with the United States on such things. The idea of a tsunami caused for volcanic activity in Tonga um, causing these things to be bobbing around in the surf was an abhorrence, I think, that the uh, the power elites in Tonga decided to abandon um, on the sensibilities of that kind of thing. But um, look, I pick up uh, Matthew's um, uh, point here that there are arguments within even blue-green political spheres that nuclear technologies in the future relating to energy um, are um, methods where decarbonizing carbonizing their economies can take place. That's up for obviously strength, strong debate and um, response in such areas. We're talking in general terms in the defence space. But Paul, over to you to those two things. I'll bring them up on screen. Oh, uh, yeah. Well, first, I, I do think that we need to have a national discussion about uh, nuclear energy. Uh, I agree with Matthew. Uh, times have changed. People have mellowed on the issue. Uh, technologies involved are much more efficient. But we need a national discussion because it's very clear, and you know this better than me, that the non-nuclear identity is part of New Zealand's at least political identity. And uh, you know, it may be very hard for people in larger states to understand how integral it is, particularly to my generation of New Zealanders, so boomers and those types. Uh, they were at the forefront of the struggle to, uh, to eliminate nuclear anything. Yeah, and, and while we still uh, see, but, um, you know, the children of the Pacific um, suffering the consequences of, of external powers decisions relating to nuclear uh, uh, weapon testing, uh, that, that culture lives on of resistance to that. Right. Yeah. Exactly. So, I, you know, you know, larger states need to understand that this is not a passing issue for New Zealanders. Having said that, uh, you know, we need to have a discussion about uh, you know renewable energy, cleaner energy, all those sort of things. But we'll leave that aside for a moment. What I failed to mention in my initial segment was something that actually is at the core of AUKUS. I can't believe that I, I didn't bring this up. Um, to give you an idea, I have an old submariner friend, a guy who uh, was commanded LA class attack submarines, uh, I believe he was the executive officer on an Ohio class boomer submarine, the ones with the, uh, the nukes. They just lurk someplace and they're ready to go. Uh, so, you know, a guy who spent his Navy career uh, as a submariner. And I, I, when AUKUS came about, I asked him uh, what he thought. I was actually just asking about the Virginia class boats, right? Because this guy would know. And it turns out he hasn't been on them but there are definite improvement over the LA class boats. And he was very reticent to talk, as you would imagine. This guy's been dealing with serious secrets. And then, you know, that of course, but he did say an interesting thing. He said, you realize of course, that the greatest advantage of these AUKUS submarines will be in the intelligence field, 
not in a kinetic environment. And that's all he said. Now that got me to thinking, there lies the importance of this. Submarines, particularly these sort of attack submarines, are known to loiter around undersea cables, fiber optic data uh, transmission cables, including the main trunk lines that link the US West Coast with Australasia. Submarines spend a lot of time in and around those cables, and not just US submarines, you know, others as well. So there's a lot of cat and mouse going on there. These type of nuclear powered submarines can stay on station, you know, much longer. I mean, six months to a year, depending on the exact boat. Uh, and they can listen. They can, they can be used for offensive as well as defensive operations. And you were mentioning the C CSIS crowd, talking about the lack of forewarning of the five eyes and everything. That's exactly where that will go. The intelligence gathering of these subs will go to Five Eyes, okay, right to them. And uh, do not underestimate the sophistication of their intercept capability, okay? They, you know, Edward Snowden made, you know, a big deal about hoovering up, you know, all sorts of metadata called, uh, in a program called PRISM, split yeah. the light. Well, uh, guess who does that? Yeah. Guess who does what, that? Well, what, what I'd so, suge suggest in that area, just before we move on to a different point, is um, there was part of discussion that seemed to hold water where it was the evaluation, the assessment of the information, in particular in theatre that may be conflicting with China. Um, and it, I, underneath that, where it wasn't discussed, was were unanswered questions, and they would be, has there been professional development that is adequate, for example, with respect to assessing and analysing Chinese-sourced intel? And it, it, that may be a part of it. So irrespective of the gathering mechanisms, we know that that is colossal, and the Snowden leaks showed that very clearly. It is the assessment in theatre and also being able to assess whether or not the intelligence is accurate and is one of providing reliable factual information where decision-making can occur. Now, without that assessment being pure, I would argue that it is dangerous and folly to try and make decisions on failed intelligence. We saw it in Iraq. So, you know, I rest my case on that. But I pick up the point relating to hardware retrieval of intelligence and the mechanisms that you're saying there is probably, I, I think you're absolutely right, it's right on 100% probably the reasons why submarines as opposed to anything else seem to be the hardware of choice at the moment relating to AUKUS. Um, but then I'm not a military or hardware or weaponry specialist, so I, I leave things like that to you, Paul, in, in, in assessing that. But that's where I'd just add on to um, is relating to the difficulties of assessment of intelligence in field prior to an event and during. Yeah, I guess I, I'd agree that the, the analysis and assessment component of intelligence collection is its Achilles heel because a lot of analysts bring in their prejudices and biases. Uh, but that's why you're supposed to have triangulation uh, in analysis as well as sourcing. Uh, and so um, I agree with you. There, there's there's deficiencies throughout. I think personally, um, intelligence agencies should hire more people well versed in comparative politics, uh, who are fluent in the languages of the countries that they're they're observing, uh, as opposed to people who may come out of military backgrounds or that sort of thing. Uh, but that just happens to be a prejudice of mine. Now I will say this, just so we can sort of conclude the AUKUS discussion. Two things. Uh, in, in light of our discussion about how the U.S. is increasingly viewed as unstable and, uh, and, and unpredictable, and for justified reasons, I mean, just take a look at the states. Here is a country where a guy who has swastikas and S, Waffen FS tattoos murders a bunch of people at a mall, and some Republicans and the conservative media say he's not a Nazi. He can't be a Nazi because he's Mexican-American. Um, they obviously haven't read the literature on second-generation Mexican-Americans 
and their racism. And that literature is extensive. Uh, but this is the sort of stuff, the guy's got stuff carved into him. Um, and, and then, of course, the screeds on social media. So on that angle, I would say the toughest job in the world today is to be a U.S. diplomat trying to defend the United States as a reliable ally. Uh, I'd hate to be a political officer or the vice counsel. See, ambassadors are show ponies. But, um, you know, the number two guy in embassies, you know, that poor person, number two guy, number, you know, number two person, you know, has to, you know, what are you going to say to people in light of what's going on back home? I mean, really, that's that's a tough job. Now, you did make an, uh, yet another good point, which is New Zealand should welcome multipolarity. Small countries can find room to maneuver in a multipolar world if they play their cards with nuance and some degree of tact. Uh, that's because when you have rigid bipolar or unipolar world, basically everybody's got to come to heel on one side or the other or, you know, under the hegemon uh, and try to establish, you know, horizontal relationships that don't annoy the big powers. But now balancing occurs in multipolarity. There's constant shifting of coalitions and alliances depending on the specific issue. That is where New Zealand can really benefit. The unfortunate part is this. When we talk about AUKUS, when, when our business elites want to get a piece of the pie in Pillar 2, and, and to Matthew's point, Pillar 2 is just about the economic benefits. Okay, It's a non-military. It's the technologies that are going to be part of the supply chain into uh, the, the AUKUS submarines, you know, but, but way downstream. And so it's a purely economic deal, which is why New Zealand elites went at it. I mean, the military elites, of course, always want some military aspect, but the push is coming more from the economic side. You know, we can develop value-added industries. Yeah, as a just add in New those. Zealand's law, though, it prevents it from actually developing technologies that assist in the nuclear weapon uh, uh, industries. So, you know, there, there are roadblocks to such things with respect to New Zealand. But just adding that into a New Zealand context so that those overseas would be able to appreciate these things. Yeah, again, I don't have objections to Pillar 2, um, but pending seeing the details, right? But there's one fundamental problem, and I'll leave, I'll leave it you know, from a New Zealand perspective in my mind. Uh, as you well know, Selwyn, uh, New Zealand used to be a champion of non-proliferation. We used to have diplomats who were experts in arm control. Uh, all of those people were retired, uh, were, were shipped out in favor of the trade zealots over the last two decades. Yeah. And that's a pity because the non-proliferation expertise that New Zealand had could have been brought to bear on our discussions about AUKUS and the larger context of what the South Pacific is in terms of its nuclear legacies. They could explain to us the possible trickle-down effect of propulsion into weaponry. I mean, I'm not the expert on disarmament and non-proliferation. But I sure as heck wish that we had diplomats today that display the same sort of zealotry when it comes to non-proliferation issues as the current lot displays towards trade. Yeah, you know, there's been that, some rebuilding, but I pick up, you know, in the, in, since 2017, there's been some rebuilding and balancing um, trade to d the diplomatic wing. Um, but it was eroded down, definitely, in my view, under the John Key years, um, the John Key uh, Prime Minister in New Zealand for the national, more conservative uh, centre-right uh, parties here in New Zealand. And uh, that, that um, trade-led, trade zealotry that was advanced there saw the uh, retirement or removal of some significant people and uh, you know everybody has a has the ability and the um, you know the the beauty of being able to retire at some stage in their lives but I think you're right and two people come to mind when you talk in such ways relating to our diplomatic wing and it's David Patton who was uh, a, a, you know a, a diplomat ambassador um, administrative administrator of Tokelau in the latter part of his years that was a huge loss I think to New Zealand in respect to him and Rosemary Banks who was our 
permanent representative at the United Nations for quite some time and also ambassador to, uh, to France and many other significant postings. And those wise heads like that among them are ones that New Zealand, I think, has been trying to catch up, rebuild, so that that intellectual and professional development grant is in evidence. Great point you made there, Paul, and I 100% agree to it. There's, um, just before we uh, close the AUKUS thing, um, there's a, co a, a, a comment um, that's come through from David Mooring, and he's a regular commentator to us. Thank you, David, for being here. Um, won't all the manned submarines be completely out of date by developments? in unarmed autonomous drones by the time they are delivered. And I'll just add to David's comment there that the uh, AI w um, elements of assessment are obviously going to be significant um, probably within the next five years, but that's, I'm just putting that timeline out there. Um, but those are an element of uh, technology advancements that are going to be uh, huge. And we all know the genie's out of the bottle with respect to this, and it's a matter of how um, countries in general terms, commerce and business, but significantly amongst uh, the security, intelligence and defence fraternities, how do we respond to such things in a theatre of conflict or the consideration of retaliatory response? So, uh, David Mooring, thank you for that comment, Paul. Um, should we wrap up the August um, uh, yeah. element and <coughs> yeah, just let, touch on the headlines? Yeah, let me just say, yeah, let me just say one last thing. Uh, and thanks, David, for that. I, I don't think we're going to see uh completely unmanned submarines uh of this sort um for several decades and there's many reasons for that but uh let's just say that the investments in current technologies and stuff and the fact that a lot of them amongst the big powers carry nuclear weapons makes the possibility of you know something happening by mistake in an unmanned vessel uh way too prohibitive uh but it will come eventually one last thing selling I'd add to your list of, of diplomats, Terence O'Brien, the recently departed Terence O'Brien. Uh, he, he represented that old school of diplomat and was our uh, ambassador to the United Nations, among other things. Uh, and that my point is this. If New Zealand's going to take advantage of multipolarity, which is clearly happening, OK, it's not it's not stopping. We're moving to a multipolar world. We need diplomats like Terence and the people you mentioned. Uh, we don't need these trade zealots. You need people who are skilled in things other than trade. And that's where the rebuilding project, if it's happening, uh, needs to be encouraged and needs to be funded because we will not be able to maneuver deftly in uh, an emerging multipolar world if we don't have people whose sole remit uh, is trade. You know, we have to find other skill sets to be able to take advantage of the moment, the emerging moment. And so that's where I'd leave it, because multipolarity allows us to, among other things, turn our backs on AUKUS. Uh, again, everybody knows that New Zealand is of the West when it comes to security. Uh, they're not going to, you know, we're not going to be joining the Chinese or the Russians anytime soon. But we need to have room to maneuver. You know that I don't believe that we have an independent foreign policy, but we do have a fairly autonomous one. And we should be able to pick and choose the issues, you know, which side we're going to join on various issues. And so the return to more traditional diplomacy with an emphasis on things like nonproliferation, I think would be good for the country as a whole. Uh, with that, I'm done. Okay, let's just headline, Paul, so that in uh, the future episodes we will obviously be digging into elements of this and the headlines um, being the latest on the US Pentagon leaks, what's really happening here, and also um, the geopolitical theatre, the global geopolitical theatre on how stable in this, you know, just to headline this, Paul, is the Russian Federation's Vladimir Putin's regime at this time. So those are the two things I just want to touch on. All we need at this stage is a bit of a tester and a taster and a teaser for um, the, yeah. the uh, future episodes. Yeah, how about this? I'll, I'll, I'll skip the uh, Discord leaks. Although for the listeners, I'll just say this, because Selwyn, Selwyn knows my line on this. Um, the Discord leaks, so that young airman who put up top secret and secret compartmentalized information onto uh, Reddit, 4chan, to these various chat groups, and he's doing it to impress his mates. Uh, who were gamers, uh, that leak is far worse than the Snowden leaks by a lot because it covers pretty much every subject
that US intelligence uh, observes. It reveals sources and methods. Um, it's a disaster. And if you notice the US response, everything's gone real quiet. Uh, with Snowden, they talked about Snowden for a lot and oh, he's a traitor, blah, blah, blah. Uh, here, they've just gone silent because this is this is a disaster. Um, it's been a gold mine for adversaries. And of course, it reveals that the US spies on its allies as well. And, you know, everybody does it. So I'm not really that, you know, concerned about that. All I got to say is this, and we can come back and I can describe uh, how I got top, top secret SCI clearances back in the day versus how this airman got it. But the, the deal is this, if it turns out he gave this information purposefully to among others, Russians, because there were Russians amongst his circle of gamers, He's not only going to get charged with unlawful uh, retrieval of classified documents or dissemination, uh, he's going to get charged with espionage. Penalty for espionage is death. Uh, I don't think they'll put him to death, but um, he'll be in jail for a long time. I don't think he's getting Sound, out of it. Sounds like there's um, potential for him to be, uh, you know, the new generation's Eldrick Ames or, or, or Bobby Hansen. And, uh, you know, they, they've never seen the light of day ever since you know, those super max has been their, uh, their, their future. Um, so, you know, I pick up the differences. There's a whole new uh, motivation in each of those cases. Explosions, car wrecks, and that sort of thing in recent months. Um, the play is on. And the question is, will Prigozhin get eliminated uh, and Putin will prevail, or will it be the other way? See, they can't take Prigozhin out now because Wagner are the only thing standing between Russian defeat in Bakhmut and, uh, and, and, and victory. And so if they kill off the Wagner boss and his mercenaries leave, the Russians will fall. Uh, that's the deal. And there's where Prigozhin has support within the Russian military because there are military commanders who feel that the top of the Russian military is too soft, too corrupt, too uh, wedded to their desks and not proactive, you know, not get out there and do the business. And Prigozhin represents to them what a real general should look like. And, um, and so that spells trouble for Putin. Uh, now he's got inside his military people who would rather go the Wagner way than uh, go the Red Army way. And so this is only going to get worse over the next few months, and it's anyone's guess who's going to prevail. Okay, thank you for that, Paul. Perfect teaser for our future episode, and no doubt uh, we'll be digging in deep to that, a deep dive, as they say, right? So um, uh, to you, Paul, thank you for your contribution today uh, with all of these areas that we've uh, traversed, and also uh, to those that have... Uh, been involved in the program and also those who have watched. Also, a thank you to those that are going to be watching this uh, on demand. And um, once again, we intend to be back in two weeks' time. Um, put it in your calendar if you can, and we will dig into some of these big global issues and see how they impact on the rest of the world. Um, so I'm just uh, going to bring up David. Thank you. He's just put a comment in there. Great to have Evening Report and Paul Buchanan's 36 Parallel um, dot com. I, I just added that part um, back on again. Thank you to Dr. Paul Buchanan and myself. I think I said something about Russian conscripts last year. Yes, David, you certainly did. So it'll be a good good program that we've got planned. Um, to all of those people, once again, thank you very much. Um, we look forward to bringing this program back to you um, very, uh, very shortly in two weeks' time. Until that time, uh, take care out there, and uh, we'll see you soon. Tanakwe.